Welkom bij alweer de 18e editie van Skin Deep, een talkshow van de Rode Hoed. Nou, we hebben bij Skin Deep echt heel veel verschillende gasten gehad, maar nog nooit een schrijver uit Kenia, Oost-Afrika om precies te zijn. En ik vond het ontzettend leuk om te mogen spreken met Nanjala Nyabola. Ze schreef dit boek, Traveling While Black, Essays Inspired by a Life on the Move. Meer dan 70 landen bezocht ze en ze had er van alles over te vertellen. Hello everyone and welcome to a special edition of Skin Deep, a talk show that discusses the various elements and layers of race, discrimination and inequality. And I'm very delighted tonight to introduce our guest, Nanjala Nyabola, a writer and political analyst from Kenya, East Africa. Her work focuses on the intersection between technology and politics, as well as migration and human mobility. And in her latest book, Traveling While Black, Essays inspired by a life on the move, she explores the world and challenges common assumptions about human mobility. I enjoyed reading all her essays about her travels from Nepal, Botswana, Sicily, Haiti, New York, and Nairobi. You should do that too. The lens from which she looks into the world opens minds and confronts, and at moments brought me to tears. I was also laughing, I must say. Professor of History of Africa and the African Diaspora, the legend Hakim Adi said, a unique and provocative and thoughtful collection of essays about her book. The New York Times said, it's a rigorous meditation on what it means to move through the world as a black African woman, thought provoking. Tonight, we will discuss what it feels like to move through a world designed to limit and exclude her. Her experiences as a black woman who has traveled to more than 70 countries and what travel can tell us about our sense of self, home, belonging, and identity. I would like to welcome you to Skin Deep, Nanjala. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. It's, it's a blessing. I, 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 your book is a game changer. Uh, it's a voice that we need to hear more of. But we're in Amsterdam. This is Skin Deep. And in my research, I found something. You lived in Amsterdam. You were in Holland. So now- I lived in Den Haag. Den Haag. Spill the, outside. spill the tea. <laughs> Spill the tea. Did you like Holland or was this because you're very honest in your book? You're like, this place yeah. is horrible. I had to pee on the corner of the so tell us what's what's up with Holland? Uh, you know, it was a very interesting experience. Um I love how I love the parks. And for me as a woman, one of the things that I really loved about living in the Netherlands was how I could cycle to the nightclubs and cycle home by myself and be safe. I love being able to walk around and cycle and, and that freedom when you grow up in a lot of urban spaces like, you know, Nairobi doesn't have any bike paths, doesn't really have any in cycling infrastructure. So I really appreciated that and, and that level of freedom. Yeah. I think one interesting thing I found about the Netherlands was in most places, um, it wasn't the anti-Black racism that hit me first, it was the anti-Arab racism yeah. that is a lot of people experience first, because I think um, when you've been to the US, when you've been to other places where anti-Black racism in, in, in the narrow sense is more in your face, you're kind of on edge about it. Like you're just like, I'm, I'm ready and I'm waiting for that sort of thing. But I was really surprised at the time at how easily a lot of people that I encountered would say things about, you know, Moroccans and, and North Africans and think that I would want to be part of that conversation. I'd yeah. be like, why like would you, you be, yeah. why would you be comfortable saying that to me? <laughs> why would you say that <laughs> yep. to me? And, yep. and like, I think, you know, in, in, in it, and people who I didn't expect that from, it was like, uh, same, I had a similar experience when I was in the Czech Republic where people would say things about Roma people and think that they were not being racist. And I was like, uh, you know, there, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the same thing that you're doing. You're just not doing it to me. And the idea that I would not, that I would want to be part of that is very strange to me. Um, I think that the Netherlands was a very, I, it was, it was a lot of, interesting conversations, uh, people with different backgrounds. There's so many people from different backgrounds um, and people, you know, group identities working. This is one of the things, points that I made in the book, group identities work in, in different ways in different contexts. And um, in as much as I had all of these new freedoms 
you know, in terms of cycling, in terms of exploring the countryside by myself, you know, cycling from Den Haag to Delft to Amsterdam, like it was such a freeing thing, but then sort of this other side of this identity um, race question, which is I think Dutch people uh, as a whole kind of just need to have more conversations about the kind of society, um, you know, the societies that they want to build. I think, um, I, and, 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 and like, again, you know, in, in the US, we spend, people spend a lot of time thinking about African, African-American, sort of the black white dichotomy, but of course, humans are just a plethora of identities. And so like, there's so many Indonesian people in, in the Netherlands and people from Suriname. And I was just really fascinated by how all of these dynamics sort of came together. And I think that there is a lot of space for a lot more conversations about this. And I think there's a lot more, um, uh, inclusion that I think could happen yeah. in different ways. Um, but I did, I honestly, on the whole, I had a great time. I think, um, yeah, well, I had fun. You, you hit me with this book because I am also one of those Dutch people. And even though I am the host of a show where we discuss racism and we point fingers at white people and asking them to do their homework, you showed me in Traveling While Black that I, as a Black Dutchman, am not aware enough of the plight of the refugees yeah so because how should we deal with that like so i'm black yeah. oh i'm anti-racism yeah. but at the same time there's people hitting the shores here in europe who come yeah. from our continent and i'm yeah. just having my tea and coffee and you know so what's your take on on, on that aspect of being here yeah i mean this is this is one of those things that once your eyes is open to it you can't close them again once you start to appreciate what's happening in the world in terms of refugees, I mean, you saw what happened uh, in Haiti with the Haitian uh, refugees and migrants in the United States, you know, sending horses and, and whipping people sort of back in the water. Like the global situation with refugees and migrations has deteriorated so much in the last 20 years. And there's just not enough awareness of not only that the situation is as bad as it's ever, or as the worst that it's ever been, but also that there's a racist dimension to what's happening. There's a racist dimension to the way policy is being created and, and being implemented. That means that black refugees, black migrants, you know, are bearing the brunt of some of these policy uh, choices because they are black. So when you think about the disparities between how Haitians are being treated in the United, I mean, it's bad enough that Latin Americans are being held in cages and being separated from their children. That's already like, really despicable, um, you know, human behavior. But now we're seeing Haitians being whipped back and being beaten back. Like, it's like there's a level of tolerance for cruelty that is intricate, intricately connected to how the rise of the right, um, especially in, in, in Europe, but also in North America. And this uh, narrative that normalizes cruelty to people of specific racial backgrounds um, in the name of migration policy. When we see what's happening in the Mediterranean Sea, that we, it's become acceptable to let people die. Like in the last 20 years, we've gotten to a point where every week, even right now, as we're speaking, right, it's not the 3,000, uh, 4,000 deaths that we saw in 2017, 2016, but it's still happening. Boats are capsizing in the Mediterranean Sea because the European Union has said we're not going to do humanitarian assistance um, for boats that are. Um, you know, in Australia, we're talking about people leaving Papua New Guinea, leaving uh, Myanmar, and, and the decision to actually detain people indefinitely with no hope of, you know, ever coming out of that system um, into a normal livelihood because they were seeking asylum. And, and if, you, if, if you see it as part of the story of where the world has come from and where the world is going, and that's when I wrote the essay about the Mediterranean Sea, that's really what I was trying to tell people is stop looking at this boat that capsized today and this boat that capsized yesterday and look at it as the story of the world. What is happening in the world that we're building that has created this tolerance for mass death and especially mass death of black people who are seeking asylum yeah. and seeking protection. Thank and you. And then you get scared then you really start to yep. get scared. 
Yep. And, and we're going to try and, and walk through a bit of your book, but also about your thoughts on, on issues we discuss at Skin Deep, which are usually about black and white. But zooming into your story, which is, I, if I could conclude, you, you prove that the, the black reality is complex. It has layers. It, it, there is no monolith. There is nothing. So by zooming into you and your life, let's start with who is Nanjala and where did that beautiful name come from? Because then we get a sense of, who who's giving us all this wisdom um the word nanjala it's a it's a it comes from western kenya and it means a girl born during the dry season because i was born during the dry season in february um and it all but also really in the literal sense it means a girl during the time of hunger um which i love uh not a lot of people like it because it's it's a it's a heavy name so you often don't hear the feminine version, you'll hear the masculine version, which is Wanjala. But um, I like it because I think it means, uh, you know, a person who is ambitious. Um, it is a product, you know, I'm, I'm, this book, what it reflects is a life journey uh, from someone whose life was very much about her immediate community, you know, family, friends, neighbors, whose life starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger as she travels and starts to see social issues that she once thought were just about her, you know, IDs, identity cards, um, relation, as being part of this broader international story about place and home and belonging and identity. And one of the things that you said that's really I'm glad that you picked up on is I wanted to have a conversation about race that decenters whiteness. Not because I don't think whiteness is a, a, a construct that we have to engage with, but because I my my objective is not um, my objective is freedom. I want freedom for people. I don't want people to define their blackness as what whiteness is not. Right, I don't want us to continue to because that's really the construction of race and is a product of, um, you know, how you know if we think about, for example, colonization and how the dehumanization of African people and and you know uh, Asian people around the world is a product of whiteness uh, telling a, uh, trying to tell the story about the other being savage and scary and whatever, and. I want us to think about who we are in the world as black people beyond being what whiteness is not. Mm -hmm. And so what, that's one of the things that I was trying to sit in the book is to do with that, to deal with that complexity. Okay, so who are we as black people, as African people, as African women, who are we in the world when we are not centering whiteness as the standard, as the measure for our identities. And, and so I do it, yeah. No, go ahead. I do it, I do it, but I, I want people to, and that's the, as what you talked about, the zooming in, that's why the zooming in was part of the intellectual process. Because it was like, well, then where do we begin? We begin the foundational building blocks. Who is the I yeah. in this story? It reminds me of what playwright, uh, I think it's August Wilson, who, who wrote mm -hmm. Fences. He said, by zooming into the Black experience, you find a universal experience. But we're constantly doing it the other way. But I mean, you came in kicking because three chapters about Africa. Uh, and then I'm your publisher. Uh, well, uh, Jandela, can we do it? So how does that work? Is that like, a, is that you saying, free the people, I'm going to go in for Africa and I'm just deliberately going to go for three chapters? Or was it that was something... It was a conversation. It was definitely a conversation. And I'm, you know, Hearst has been a very supportive publisher. Uh, my editor, Lara, she was fantastic. Um, but it was definitely, we had conversations about it. And, and to be able to say to your editor, look, this is the story that I'm trying to tell. I know that there are all these other stories to tell, but this is the story that I want to tell. Um, it's a product of having a very supportive uh, publisher and a very supportive and engaging publishing process. Um, and, and I, you know, that's what I said from the beginning when I pitched the book is that I don't want to tell the story, a story that the world wants to hear. I want to tell the story that I want to tell. I want to give, have the narrative that I want to give. 
I am an African woman. I sit mostly, not right now, but my sit in Africa, my, my viewpoint is from Africa. And we have to get to a place in the world where Africans can tell complicated stories and nuanced stories based on where they sit and that our identities are shaped by our experiences and not necessarily what, um, you know, for example, the conversation that you're having in Europe or the conversation that other people are having in the United States. Of course, there are things that unite us. And I, I think you'll see even in the book, there are things that unite the stories, but we have, as black people, we have the right to be complicated. Exactly. Right, the right to be nuanced. So, so discussions with your publisher, but then this book you say, it's, it's, it's not a memoir, uh, not a travel memoir, but, but, but what is it? For people that haven't read the book yet and they, they hear us talk, hmm. how would you describe it then? If it's not a travel uh, memoir? It's, it's, I didn't want to call it a travel memoir because it's not a linear story. It's yeah. not like, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. It's not a linear story. It's really just a gathering of reflections. It's a gathering of experiences. It's um, perspectives, I guess. Uh, and the uniting thread in all of them is that these perspectives are gathered from the experience of travel, they're, they're, the, the, the experience of human mobility. And, and again, the, one other reason why I didn't want to call it the travel memoir is because there are a lot of essays about home. There are a lot of essays about um, that start from, you know, my hometown, my, my, you know, experience of my home country. And then, you know, as you said, three essays about Africa. Um, so it's partly also me just saying to the genre people, look, I get it that travel memoirs have this arc, but this, this book doesn't necessarily have that arc. It's really just a gathering of, of essays yeah. about all of this stuff. Yeah. 70 countries or maybe and counting. Where, and did, counting. where did this interest for traveling start? What was the, what was the hmm. spark? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that I like who I am when I am on the road. And one of the things that I write in the book is about being a, a, an African woman, being a black woman, especially, um, you often get boxed into other people's stories very early on and other people's expectations of you very early on. And your world starts to get small very early on in the sense that um, people start telling you what you can't do, where you shouldn't go, what you shouldn't do very early on. And so for me, I think travel has been an act of personal resistance. Because when I travel, I can really be anybody that I want to be. And there's a, there's a, a you can detach yourself from expectations. Yeah. Um, and just very quickly as an illustration, I, I recently started riding a motorcycle and I, you know, doing cross, I did a big cross country trip on the motorcycle um, uh, last month. And I was sharing the story with people and I had all these African women sort of come up to me uh, on the so, you know, social media and be like, I, it, I had, it had never occurred to me that this was a thing that African women could do. Yep, yep, amen. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and so that's kind of what drives me, but also what drives the storytelling is that we are often as African women living in the prism of other people's expectations and ideas about what we should be interested in and how we should be in the world. And travel is a great opportunity to push back against those expectations and, and really just be yourself. Yeah. Was your family supportive when you started going to places like the middle of nowhere? Because like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I could a understand bit. a bit of that. Like, not even a little bit. I, no. I, 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 no. no. <laughs> and okay. Like, I think now they're just like, it's it's part of the brand now. It's part of who I am. This one, she's finished education. Yeah, she also travels. They've accepted it. Just, it's just accepted now. But um, look, it, the, what do they say? It's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, because cause I, I, I think you're setting, you're, you know, you're rattling the cage and those women that came to you on social media, it's also men, because let's be honest, I also have all these conceptions, like, I don't even want to think about it, because that's like, that's, that's for other people. But you write this book, and then COVID hits. And um, it brings the world to, to a standstill. 
it, it made your book more relevant to many of us here in the West or the North or the, however you want to call it, because we lost our freedom to move. And that is actually something that many of us take for granted. I mean, the whole world locked down, uh, the whole world in Holland, people are like, no, there was a rebellion. Like, we don't want to have this. So what impact has COVID had, COVID-19, on the non-white population that you've been seeing traveling around the world? Um, so two things. One is uh, because the, the rate of uh, spread in Africa has been slower than it has been in Europe, actually the borders have remained open to Africans. We were already few Africans who could travel, but for those few Africans who could and were traveling, the borders have remained open in a way that they have for Europeans. So one of the interesting conversations that I've been having with European people is how have you been able to go to the United States? And I'm like, well, the, they never closed the borders to Kenyans in the way that they closed the borders. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I've, my sense is a lot of people have been struggling with that reality that that sort of shift in in policy even though i think we all know that it's temporary and um, i think that the the political connections between the us and europe um it's just it's it's a matter of when not a matter of if mm. in the same way that it is and this is my second point for the non for the global majority it's a question of if if the world will ever be open to us again i'm paying close attention to this vaccine passport issue because i think that and if you look, if you recall the essay that I wrote about migration and human mobility, mm. we've normalized racist double standards in migration policy. And layering this other issue is, I think, of you know, um, how can we make vaccination a prerequisite for travel for the global majority when only three percent of the population in the global majority is vaccinated at the moment and that Western countries, rich countries are actively standing in the way of making vaccines more available, yeah. right? Charity, what we're being told, you know, we're pledging to donate, to give to whatever, cannot make up for sustainable solutions, cannot yep. make up for giving people access to the IP, supporting the research. It can't, we can't substitute that. So next five years, if we don't call a pause on, on these international travel restrictions that the way, the direction that they're going, my concern is, and I think the concern of the global majority is that we're going to be told even more clearly that you are not simply not welcome here. So, so the gap will become bigger, the already existing gap. Much bigger, gap. much bigger. Look at, look at what happened with the UK, sorry. Um, look at what happened with the UK's vaccine policy they announced last, uh, in, in September. And they're saying that um, if the UK manufactured AstraZeneca vaccines and gave the technology to India and then issued a policy saying, unless you've been vaccinated in the EU and in Australia and in the United States, your vaccination certificate is not valid, you still have to quarantine. Even though the UK manufactured the vaccine and donated the vaccine to Kenya to be administered to Kenya, Kenyans cannot use that vaccination certificate to get into the United Kingdom yeah. without quarantine. So, so that... Yeah, that's the word. double standard. Yeah, and, and that is, and that's something you describe in your book. You also use yeah. the word racialized travel. Yeah, it is because when you when you apply for a, a student visa to go to the United Kingdom, for example, there are all of these extra requirements that Africans uh, deal with that a lot of people, the European travelers, don't even know exist. When I tell people that um, you know to apply for a U.S. student visa, you not only need to go through the visa process, but you also have to go through a Homeland Security clearance person, which is an extra two hundred fifty dollars. And I tell that to European students, you know, when I was in law school, they're like, "I didn't even know this was a thing." And it's like there's a whole set of regulations that apply to people of specific national origin and specific um, racial origin that are normalized. Nobody even questions it anymore that there's this whole, for example, as I said, this um, Homeland Security clearances that Africans and Asians have to do before they can get a student yeah. visa. Um, it's the same with in the UK, there's extra health uh, checks and things like that. And believe and, me, the, the same is going on here in the Netherlands. But what, what you're actually describing, and that's why I'm, I'm happy to have you on here on the show uh, for Skin Deep, is because we, we, we discuss the racism we encounter here in the Netherlands. But unless you have a family member or uh, 
a partner who has to get in, you're not really aware, even as a black person, about the, the inequality that goes on. And this is what your book does. It constantly sheds light on different aspects of this yeah. inequality. Yeah. I am, I'll, however, I'll, huh? If I can give you sorry, yeah. one example, um, the Canadian student visa that everybody talks about how Canada is great for students and things like that. Um, and I think I put this statistic in the book, 100% of all student applications, visa applications from Canada, to, from Somalia, from Mozambique, from a handful of Af uh, other African countries are rejected every year. 100%? 100%, every single one. In Mozambique, 100% rejections. Um, the average rejection rate for visas for student visas in Canada is 39% in the global average. For Africa, I think it's 67%. I have the exact statistics in the book. Like every, there's this, so there's the public image of Canada as this welcoming utopia for people of all national origins. But actually, if you look at the numbers on Canadian immigration and Canadian visa issuance, you'll find that Africans are rejected much more than people from any other um, uh, continent. And the thing is, each rejection represents a financial investment. Someone has paid $160, $200, you know, gotten the notarized certificates, gotten their all done all of this uh, investment and still gotten to the finish line and been told you're not welcome here. We had this issue with the um, African Studies Conference in uh, Edinburgh a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic. Every single African who applied for a visa to attend this African Studies Conference had their visas rejected. Yep. So, and we only been... and we only find out when, um, for example, Wizkid is booked at the North Sea Jazz Festival and he can't come because half of his band doesn't get a visa. And then there's a, an op-ed yeah. saying, "Why is this part?" But Nanjala, let me ask you the rhetorical question: mm -hmm. Do Black Lives Matter then? <laughs> because this also came about during the COVID nineteen yeah. pandemic and. I want Black Lives, I think Black Lives Matter, obviously. I think that our policies, the policies that are coming out of a lot of rich countries do not reflect that. How can the European Union issue a, a European Parliament issue a statement saying Black Lives Matter in the same week uh, uh, Frontex allows 40 people to die in the Mediterranean Sea? It would cost the entire European, even if every single person who was trying to enter the EU right now entered the EU, it would raise the population of Europe by like 2%. If every single person who was trying to emigrate to Europe right now, who was on the path right now, it would be like, and that includes the people who are trying to leave, leave Afghanistan, the people who are trying to leave Syria. So of course, Black Lives Matter but the practice of making Black Lives Matter is wanting, especially when it comes to migration, when human mobility is not there yet, it's wanting, yeah. it's falling short. Man, in the essays, um, in your book, they were a product of, 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 of moving through the world as an African Black woman. And, and that is a world of opportunities and contradictions. Could you tell us more about those opportunities and contradictions? <laughs> The greatest joy that has come from traveling for me has been traveling in Africa. And I say that obviously with caution because I, I know that there's this whole thing of, you know, stay where you are and blah, blah, blah. But I want African people to know that a lot of the narratives that are in the world that teach us to be afraid of each other are just not accurate. They are a reflection of fears that come from other people. Um, most of my travel has been in Africa. When I go on holiday, when I'm traveling for leisure, most of it is in Africa, um, uh, precisely because I would like to know Africa better. I would like to know African communities better. I would like to, to understand us, to understand each other away from the lens of fear and otherization that comes from, you know, when we don't speak to each other directly. You know, when I go to West Africa and French speaking West Africa, everything that they know about Kenya, they've seen on France 24, they've seen on CNN, they've seen whatever. What does CNN say about Kenya? It's post-election violence, it's starvation, it's rhino poaching, it's all of this stuff. Same thing, it cuts in the other direction. You know, when people say, why do so many West African countries, why are they always having coups? And you think, well, what does always mean? What, what are you saying, suggesting by yeah. always? Because it's not always, it's 
sure it's something that's happened with certain frequency in the last couple of months, but three countries out of 54 countries is not always. Yeah. It's something that has happened, you know. And so one one of the things that has come experience is the pause as a positive is learning how to engage with African communities as peers, as equals in our own terms, without this lens, this filtered lens of otherization. And this, yeah, and this lens of otherization that you experienced it in Haiti as well. We'll get to that yeah. maybe in, in later on. But you also went to the Mount Everest, which again, shout oh. out to you, but I would never do. I mean, <laughs> and we do I'm ice sure skating, do but <laughs> like, but you describe, uh, you describe your trip uh, and you say you were raced. Yeah. Now, now I, what is raced? What does that mean? You know, the thing about um, travel is you encounter all kinds of uh, people um, who have had different experiences. So being in the Mount Everest region, it's a rural part of Nepal. It's, of course, there are many people who are on the trail from different parts of the world. In fact, the year that I was there was the record-breaking year. There were 11,000 people trying to get to Everest Base Camp. But when you talk to a person, I wanted to give space for grace for people who are not within, not powerful within the power structures that make racism possible, who are removed from, you know, the center, but are still having this experience of um, sort stereotyping people or sorting people out uh, through the lens of race. And I think you see this a lot, you know, like when you, when I go to a, when you go to a rural a village somewhere and someone encounters someone that they've never seen before from a racial background that they've never seen before, they don't have, they don't necessarily have the social uh, tools to process, you know, difference. Yeah. And I think it's important to leave grace for those people. I think when people in rural Nepal respond to you in a specific way, um, it's different from when I'm, you know, walking down the streets of New York and someone, um, uh, you know, treats me in a, in, a, in a specific way, we treat each other in a specific way. So Yeah, or, or calls you the, the N-word in, the, in a subway. That's something different. Right. Than, no, but, yeah. but to stay in Nepal, actually, you're being kind. So there's this difference between race and racism. But let yeah. me just tell you this. As a child, I lived in Nepal. Mm. And up to this day, my father still tells me, reminds me that my mother, may she rest in peace, she would walk through the streets of Nepal and she would really be yeah. you know, spit. And so, yeah, so we could be here in 2070 and, and you're still going to be kind. What happened on that mountain? Because you, you nearly lost your life. I did. I did. Because of, partially and because of racism. It is. And, and I think it's more, yeah. I mean, I, I, look, this is one of those essays that came from a very visceral place and not necessarily from a very rational place um, and it came from a visceral place because I wanted people to see how I didn't want people to read that essay and walk away thinking um, you know Nepal is terrible don't go and things like yeah, exactly. that exactly I understand I understand I wanted people to walk away from that essay and realize that this race thing will show up in the unexpected places and it will have racism being raised will show up in unexpected places and will still have serious consequences. Yeah. The, 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 the choice to treat people differently on the basis of race will show up even in unexpected places and, and have these consequences. And I don't have an answer, you know, in the sense that I'm trying to be in the world as someone whose political practice, but also individual, is guided by love and is guided by kindness and is guided by generosity. But the question that you've asked is really important and urgent. At what point does kindness stop and yeah. accountability starts and, and you know, pushing back starts? And I wanted people to sit with that because I'm still sitting with that. I, yeah. I, I look at pictures of myself from that week and I still have like anxiety um, and, and I don't know what the simple answer is, but I want people to understand, I wanted to emphasize that this racism, it shows up and it's not just a question of black and white, as you said at the top, yeah. there's all of these shades that are happening in between. Anti-black racism shows up in all of these shades in yeah. between and has consequences. And that's one of, was one of the moments I, I had tears in my eyes because 
you end up not getting water from somebody who's obviously being racist, but you call it being raced. Uh, eventually, you, you, you make it through. But yeah, he's, he's a 22 year he's a 22 year old kid who, who does has never been to formal has no formal education and has lived in this small village. He's a, he's the Sherpa people. He's yeah. from the community, and that's what they do. They wake up in the morning as they're born and they train to guide people to the summit of Everest. Yeah. And he's never left uh, the valley. He's never left Nepal. Uh, barely, you know, he's leaving the mountains to go to um, Kathmandu to pick up guests to take to, to Everest. So when I, one of my favorite books of all time is Brian Stevenson's um, Just Mercy. And one of the things he says in that book, Brian Stevenson says this all the time, we are all more than the worst thing that we have ever done in our lives. Yeah. And trying to reconcile, I, I think what I, I, I str I'm struggling with in that essay is trying to reconcile that political position that this kid probably doesn't know any better. Yeah. But it's still a bad thing. And, and, and I understand. And, and, I, and, I, and It's exactly. like, how do you do that? No, no, I know. <laughs> and, and that brings me to the question. Is, don't you think that there's racing going on here in the West, even though people have the information? And how should we deal with that? Because at what point do you say, hey, uh, this is no longer the ignorance of the other, but it's your responsibility because I nearly yeah. died. Yeah, I mean... You, you know, that, like, uh, so let's uh, take it away from the mountain and just bring it over here. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, where I've landed on this issue is that people who know, people who have no reason not to know have to be held accountable. Yeah. If you're living anywhere where you have access to information and access to other people, you have no excuse not to know. Yeah. You have no excuse not to know. You have no excuse to not be held accountable. I think that, and this is again, because I don't spend my time, you know, traveling. I do, I have traveled through Europe, but you know, there's a difference between encountering that in rural Nepal, rural India, and the streets of Milan and the streets of New York. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a valid, as a political, as a thinker, I don't know if that's a fully valid uh, distinction. It's a distinction that helps me make sense of the world. Well, I, I understand you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like, and, and I, I'm genuinely and truly. That's you. You can even when you see the essay collection. That's one of the essays that has like the least theoretical, um, you know, backing or anything because it was something that I felt like it's something that I'm still processing. Yeah. It's like. I want to be nice to this person, but shit, I nearly died. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 then, and then I'll just ask one more question uh, and then I'll, yeah. I'll leave the situation in Nepal. But that touched me as a man, seeing how, how unsafe it is to be a woman in general. But as a black woman, you didn't tell your mother. And I still haven't. She still and that, that, that still gets me because that shows that you not only have to be fearless, you not only have to fight for the right to be able to go to travel, but then when you nearly die, the last thing you're going to do is going to tell your mother, which Nanjala, I mean. Yeah. And I, you know, let me tell you something. Black women, African women carry so much. I mean, you would know, you know, you've, if you, you, you spoke to your mom um, before she passed. And I think African women carry so much because there's the world is not safe for us to express our pain. Yeah. and safe for us to express our struggle. We find safety in each other. And uh, that's why uh, my feeling is that's why black female friendships are so strong and are so necessary to us because we don't find safety in the world in the same way. Um, I, there's a line that I have in the book that I think a lot of African women have come back to me and said, thank you so much for expressing this, which is when I say the world doesn't stop spinning for black women who go missing the same way that it does for white women who do go missing. 
Yeah. And that changes our perception of risk, it changes our calculations of risk and what we think is possible. So it's, as you said, finding fearlessness in that awareness, finding freedom in that awareness, knowing that the world is hostile, knowing that the world is scary and still chasing freedom anyway, Amen. and still chasing possibility anyway. I think that's the, that's the goal. You're dropping nuggets. Thank you, Nanjala. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it, I would like to, to, to continue and try and explore something that you describe in the book. And you, 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 you mentioned Steve Biko, who says being black is not a matter of pigmentation. And like, how would you describe being a black person from somebody who's had the experience of, you know, as a black African woman being around the world? What is that blackness? What is it? I'm still figuring it out. And, and this is what I was saying before about wanting to write a collection that doesn't define blackness as what whiteness is not. Yeah. That there's actually a positive definition in there that we've defined for ourselves. I think it starts with joy. I think it starts with finding joy. There's a joyfulness um, that comes from, you know, you think about people who were taken from violently from their homes and show up in slave plantations and endure the ugliness, the ugliest, ugliest things that human beings could do to each other and still make the sweetest music that probably has ever been known to man Mm. and still make the most delicious food that has ever been known to man and still, you know, build beauty and build all of this from all of this ugliness. So I think it starts from joy and I think it starts from, from salvaging joy from even the most uh, darkest situations. You look at what it is to be an African today, right now with all of the struggles that we are seeing and and difficulties that we're seeing and the music that comes from the South African minds, the music that comes from, um, you know, farms when people are on the tea farms, the joy that comes from that. I think that's one of the things that starts And I think it's important, you know, because, and this is a project that I'm thinking about more long-term, when you think about human history, whiteness as a political construct is a product of, I guess you would call it the, I don't know, I don't know European time periods very well, but like, you know, this uh, 18th uh, century, you know, that whole energy that builds up into the colonization, the partitioning of Africa. And it was serving a very specific function, the idea of sorting people out, putting people in hierarchies, putting people in whatevers. And so for me, blackness comes from a place of unifying people and focusing on what, and this is what I loved about what Biko said, focusing on what it is uh, that makes people whole and, and, and united and rather than what sorts people out into categories. Um, I'll finish with, with, you know, one thing that one of my favorite museums in the world, and I don't really like museums, one of my favorite museums in the world is the Detroit Institute of Art. And the Detroit Institute of Art has this wing of African-American art. And it's, it has an African-American wing, has a Native American wing, has a, a Asian wing, and it has a, a European art wing. The African wing is curated in such a way that it tells the story of how black people have been represented in visual art from 14th, 13th century, from rock paintings, in fact, not even 14th century, all the way to the present day. And you actually see this happen. You see how before this uh, 18th, 17th century, like Rembrandt's painting, the Moors, people painted black people with accuracy and with dignity and with pride. And then with this you know, surge in idea of sorting people, whiteness is a political contract, construct, you see, it, see the, the gully walks, yeah. you know, the caricatures and things like that. And it tells that story of how the, 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 the split between how people saw blackness and how black people saw themselves because black painters continued to paint um, in this realist tradition, continued to paint in this, idea of, of dignity, but then, you know, the mainstream European art, white art starts to see uh, this dehumanizing and, and indignifying way of portraying blackness. And so for me, it's a question of going, not necessarily going back, but forcing that reset, 
And to be black is to stand in your dignity and in your joy and in your fullness and in your contradictions and all of that and mm -hmm. not trying to reclaim this other side, which was never about us anyway. Beautiful. I, I do need to know why you don't like museums, because if you can reproduce this after being at a museum, I would say write a book about the great museums. What is this, Anjala? Tell me. Or is this going to be it? You don't like them. No, you know what I don't like about museums is museums are a product of curation. And first of all, the stealing, all of that stuff is stolen from different communities, um, gatekeeping, but then also like the museum is more about the person who is doing the curating than it is about what is curated. Who decided that the most interesting thing about Africans was masks and what have you? Like, I, I understand they're beautiful and they're whatever, but it's like, I like objects in use. I don't like objects in abstraction. I like to see them in their, con I want to see a Benin bronze in Benin. Yeah. You know, I want to see like a, a Egyptian mask in, I want to see the Rosetta Stone in Cairo. I want to see it in the context. Um, I'm with, I'm, I'm, I'm you, with you. But, I mean? but, but then can I ask you, uh, ask you, because you speak about curation and this is the whole trick. We're in Europe, there's subsidies, there's money, but the curation, there's always somebody put in the place who reproduces the whiteness. Do you, yeah. do you believe in getting into a place where we can curate or have more influence on what is curated? Or do you, are you somebody who says, F the system, uh, do it yourself. Uh, and then I'll have to ask you with which money and where and how, and the, you know, the- uh, I think I'm a bit of both. A I definitely do have an F the system streak in the yeah. way that I think about cultural production. Um, I think, but I also do think that there's more capacity in African uh, museums, galleries than people realize. The Nairobi Gallery is outstanding. Um, the, so I was just in the Museum of African Civilizations in Dakar recently. Um, you know, I think I think it's mostly just that for the longest time, we never thought that this stuff was as interesting as Europeans. Europeans were running around raiding tombs and things like that and collecting things that we were like, well, why would you steal this dead man's shoes? Why are you stealing this dead and man's they, And they saw how, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and now we're starting to see that maybe it's curation, but with a different goal in mind. Maybe the story that we will tell with our curation is going to be a little bit different. Okay, and it's so going to be a little bit contextualized. Back to that. So now we've got your answer. It's an inter interesting uh, discussion, but I think we'll, we'll have another day for that because there's still a, yeah. a few things I want to discuss with you. We spoke about whiteness, um, mm. but you also say something interesting about blackness and, and that something that it's something that some African women are trying to resist. Yeah. And I find I that think, very interesting because yeah. uh, along with the, 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 the many African writers, but also African people who actually weren't even aware of their blackness until they left Africa. This is something that is not often discussed, in, let alone in these spaces. Uh, yeah. In the diaspora. And, and I, want, I want us to have that conversation because I know what that feeling is like. I think when you leave, when you're in Africa, when you're surrounded by other things, there are other things that you're thinking about, there are other pressures that you're dealing with, but also you're li living with a received consciousness that we won the war of independence. Racism is not our problem anymore. So you don't pay attention to it in the same way. Maybe South Africa is an exception, maybe yeah. Zimbabwe is an exception, but you don't think about it on a daily basis, the way in which when you move to Europe, as a black person, you go to the United States, you go to China, you go to wherever you're gonna be a distinct, distinctly visible minority, suddenly you can't not think about it because it's everywhere. Like you said with your mom, you know, it's walking through the streets of Nepal, being spat on. You know, the one essay that we went back and forth and ended up not putting in the book was the experience that I had traveling in India um, because I didn't have a great time. I did not have a great time in Delhi and it didn't make the final cut because um, there was no way that I could tell that story without, um, it, it's, it needs more, it needs more, it needs yeah. more to go into it. And it's wanting African people, especially privileged African people to really s stop, um, uh, minimizing the impact that race, racism that has 
on the way in which our societies are structured and the way in which other people are able to live um, and be free. Yeah. When you think about, and this is, it loops, it's kind of, it's a loop that goes back to migration and goes back to the migration policy. And people are able to get wealthy to the, we have a lot of Kenyans who, for example, have bought European citizenship through you know, Cyprus, Malta, uh, all of these programs. And then they say, well, racism is not an issue. And you say, well, you've bought your way out of the ways in which this is falling on our people, the way in which migration policy is falling on our people, the way in which economic policy is falling on our people, the way in which development policy is falling on our people. So just because you don't see it every day doesn't mean it's not an issue that we need to think about every day. Um, representations of Africans in popular culture, representations of, of blackness in popular culture. Those are still things that are, you know, it's part, it's the racist sto racism, the story of racism. So, do, do, so yeah. Does it ever get uncomfortable? Because Nanjala, you're not yeah. actually not kind to anybody. You're, 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 you're telling us European blacks what to do. You're telling the Africans what they, they should wake anybody. up. Don't you ever, the, the, how does I it go when you're at a party or a barbecue? It's like, oh, there she comes. I don't, I'm actually very fun at parties and very <laughs> fun at barbecues. Because uh, when I'm off the clock, I'm off the clock. No, I know. Um, I, but you know what I mean. Like, it's, it's... I, I want, I want, like I said, my objective is not in, like, I, underst I understand, respect, and value the work that people are putting into um, challenging whiteness and, and pushing back against that. I think it's really important and I think it's really urgent. I, my, my event horizon is just different. Like, I, I, think we, I think that there is labor to be done in attaining freedom. And I think that the labor needs to be distributed through different people. We can't all do the same thing. We shouldn't all be doing the same thing. So while I respect and treasure and, and really uphold that work, I see myself as being positioned somewhere else. So my positioning is what will come after that? And thank you, you know, Franz, for that. Franz Fanon said something that I, I think about all the time. Are we, uh, he was speaking in the post-colonial context and he said, um, are we merely fighting for the end of colonization, which is a noble goal, or are we thinking about what we will do once the last white policeman leaves? So are we only thinking about uh, the deconstruction and the, you know, the end of, of racism, which is a worthy and noble goal. Are we also thinking about the world that we want to build or structuring whiteness, if you will? Or are we also thinking about the world that we will build once that task is accomplished? So I see myself as looking at my, uh, you know, at black people especially and, and saying, okay, so then, then what? Once we've convinced all of the institutions that black lives matter, how do we make that mattering make sense? How do we build on that? What kind of future do we want for ourselves as Black people? What does that look like? And that's kind of what this essay is about, a collection is about, is after we're done with uh, all of this work, which is important, then who are we? And, and who are we to each other? And that's another mm -hmm. thing you do in the book and also in this conversation. And I want to thank you for that. You're very careful. So when you take, you're careful towards the, 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 the Nepalese young man, you're careful towards the nation state India, but I think other people should be careful in everything they do, because if we're all more careful, we will actually be more caring and respectful. And you could actually get, you, you understand? It seems as if you, it's something you do, but not everybody does that, you know, be that yeah. careful. Yeah, and, and thank, you for, thank you for saying that because it is something, care is something that I really, really tried to put into this book because like I said, again, my goal is not um, merely to fight. My goal is to build yeah. and I want black people to be free. Yeah. I we, want Africans to be free. I, I, that's it, that's the goal. We still have a few, a bit, a bit of time and we, I, we discussed whiteness as a, as, as a construct, but I'm, I'm interested like in, in the relationship to power, uh, our relationship to ourselves is, is blackness constructed? And if it is, by whom and how? That's a fantastic question. So I'll take you back to um, Kenya and how blackness 
became a thing in Kenya because there's layers to it. There is uh, the Arab presence in Kenya. There is the European presence in Kenya. Um, prior to that, people are, the relation is predicated, it's ethnic identities, it's gender identities, it's class identities, because there's also class disparities between um, chiefs and, you know, people who have power and people who don't have power. The construction of an apartheid state in Kenya, and I, I write a little bit about this in the context of Nairobi, has all of these layers integrated to it and the need to define, to create a bureaucratic definition of quote unquote, the native, which is, you know, blackness in order to justify the violence of colonization. So there is a bureaucratic process of saying, there's all of these laws that are passed in the first decade of the 20th century, you know, restrictions on freedom of movement, restrictions on where you can marry, where you can live, where you can assemble, da, 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 da. All of this is a bureaucratic process that's designed to um, entrench this idea of you are black, you are native, you are less than, you are less worthy. And that is why it's okay for us to treat you terribly. And it's preceded by the process that went on in Europe, which is this idea of whiteness as, you know, the most evolved, the most blah, 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 whatever. We have a rich culture, we have a rich history, blah, blah, blah. And, and so it's this, this antagonist sort of, we have to define our, you know, as whiteness is thinking, we have to define ourselves by what we are not so that we can justify the cruelty that we're going to inflict upon the world. Yeah. And one of the, some of the examples that I give is how weirdly this stuff plays out in some of the places. Like, you know, when you go to Sudan, you have all of these black people call themselves Arabs. And, you know, we are different from, you know, Omar al-Bashir was notorious for this. You know, he would say all of these racist things about Southern Sudan on record, on tape, he's on record as the president saying, of Sudan would say that. Former, yeah, 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 former yeah, president former of president, Sudan. Yeah, yeah. All of these awful things because I am Arab and you are. And then he would go to the Gulf and, you know, be at the Gulf summits. It's like, you know, you are black and we are Arabs. And, you know, Sudanese doctors who work in, in the Gulf will tell you about experiences about treating patients and having, you know, the, this basic term that exists for blackness. And so, you know, there's an element of, it's weird. It's this weird human thing, um, political thing, because we're like the only species that does this to each other. There's nothing biologically that, you know, skin color, yes, but like you don't see, um, I don't know, uh, even like giraffes, you know, you have these albino giraffes that don't produce melanin. And so they come out white. We have a couple in Kenya, but they're still, they're just giraffes are just giraffes. The, the other giraffes don't say to them, you know what, you're not a good giraffe. Get out of the giraffe herd. We're the only species yeah. that does this. And I just keep coming back to it. It's like, is this what it means to be capable, capable, quote unquote, of higher thought? Is well, to really find excuses to be shitty to each other. Sorry for my swearing. No, no, no. I understand. But you know, you bring it, it you know, I, I, my question is, um, because what you say about Kenya, and I think people have to read the book to really mm. understand what you're saying. I have the idea that we look at history as episodes instead of in a more holistic way. And the way you opened my mind and confronted me with the connection between the European history and, you know, taking racism away from just apartheid in South Africa, but placing it in Kenya. I was like, and I'm supposed to know stuff about Africa. So what's your thought on how we can educate people to, to, to solve this problem? Is it a more holistic view or, or do you have other suggestions? I just, I just wish for people to be more curious about each other. You don't have to become an expert in the history of every single country in the world. You just have to have a healthy curiosity about how other people do yeah. life. And I think that healthy curiosity will open up the space for a lot more understanding and a lot more um, generosity and a lot more, a lot less racism. Yeah. Like I think um, for me, healthy curiosity is a mark of intelligence. I think that societies that have given up on intelligence are the ones that stop being curious about other people. Yeah. But it's, and but you, it's you see this, look at what's happening in the United States right now with all of the anti-vaccination and da, da, da. there's a pattern there. There's a level of 
we stopped caring about other people. We stopped being curious about other people. We're just invested in ourselves. And it's reflected in a lot of, it, it shows up different, in different ways. People, people need to read the book because there's so much in there. Um, you also yeah. speak about we who are black and traveling without these pre-configured networks of access and privilege that take the sting out of the dislocation and disorientation of entering a new society as rank outsider. Page 63 shows that we would actually need we need more network. We need more protection. Do you believe yep. that a green book would work? I, I watched the movie. Uh, <laughs> they like to like, don't go here if you're black or stay or do this if you're black or go to that hotel if you're black. I wish we lived in a world where I could say that it didn't, it wouldn't help. <laughs> I think it would help. I wish that we lived, I, I wish that it didn't, I, I could say that it wouldn't help because it really shows up in very unexpected places. Very quick example to close, I guess. Um, I wish I had known how difficult it would have been to be a black person in New Delhi before I got there, because I think I would have navigated the city differently. Um, same thing with Everest. I wish I'd had known that this was such a, a challenge. I would have navigated the entire experience differently. Um, so yeah, I think it would work. I think it would help. Um, and a global one at that, yeah. that basically addresses the global challenge. Nanjala, towards the end of this interview, um, do you have an idea what your next book will be about? <laughs> I do. <laughs> but you're not going to tell us. No. I do, but I'm not going to tell Yo. you. You just have to wait and, wait and see what my publisher um, says. But I think, well, I mean, I, it's not like a big secret. It's just that I, I've always believed that the role of the public intellectual is to document life as, as we are living in and to tell, to speak the truth to power. And I think it would, I think it's important to document the pandemic. And I think it's important to document what's happening with the pandemic and to speak the truth to power about how this might change our lives. So I am writing about the pandemic and I am writing about the, the again, the experiences that we're having as Africans and what the world is going to look like, uh, what I think the world is going to look like when this is over, or not I don't over. Even, not over, you know. Not like, over what? Because it's not going to be the, over. But yeah, I don't the think future? there's. A, I don't. I think the window for there to have been an over has closed. It's I closed. Eh? How, yeah, what the future might look like. Nanjala, I, I I wish you were here and I could just give you a big hug oh, and say thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish you the best. I hope you enjoyed our conversation because I, I did and and. Uh, Come back when you have new work or want to cycle in the, sure. in the Netherlands. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Dit was alweer editie 18 van Skin Deep met niemand minder dan Nanjala Nyabola. Dit boek heeft ze geschreven, Traveling While Black. En ik vond het ontzettend leuk om te lezen en ik vond het heel tof om haar te spreken. Ik hoop jullie snel weer tegen te komen bij een nieuwe editie van Skin Deep. <middels>